Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for the invite back. No, very glad to have you back. Are you basking in your viral fame since you last came on? Uh, no, because <laughs> um, that is not what happens to economists. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we are speaking the day after Budget Day. Um, we obviously want to get into all of it. Your role as Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation and as, as you've been described by the Commenters on the Politics Show YouTube channel, a mathematically gifted James A. Caster was what you've been compared oh, right. to. Yeah, very, very kind. Well, I'll, so. take mathemat- <laughs> I'll take mathematically gifted and I'll Google it afterwards. Um, before, before we get to the budget itself, I think we need to talk about banks because you have, well, you have direct experience of nationalising a few of them to begin with. Thanks, um, thanks for the flashback. <laughs> Credit Suisse, um, 44 billion loan from the central bank, Silicon Valley Bank as well, um, collapsing. Should we be worried? What's going on? Um, I, l- let's deal with some of the, su- the like micro things to worry about and then talk about whether it's worth worrying about the big picture. So um, in the UK, in terms of what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, I think we should be actually reassured that some of the changes that were made after the financial crisis were, thank you for reminding me, uh, we were in the Treasury watching banks go uh, bust a triumph of economic policy making. Um, uh, they broadly worked. So we... Uh, had a subsidiary of an American bank that was going bust, and uh, that bank didn't send all its money back to America and leave the UK um, subsidiary completely bust, uh, and it was able to be sold onto a much larger bank, uh, making sure that all the depositors are protected and without any risk to the taxpayer. And that is like the textbook, how you deal with a banking bank going bust if it's a small uh, bank. It's not a big risk for HSBC to take. They're a much bigger bank, and they wouldn't mind a bit of exposure to the tech business in the UK. So in the, from the UK perspective, you're okay. In America, I think there are bigger questions um, to be asked. That's where the behavior that got this bank into trouble was going on, which without getting into lots of details was about the people running that bank. It's not about the, how they interact with their clients. It's about how they manage their exposure to interest rate, rate risks. And interest rates have obviously spiked very fast. When interest rates goes, go up, bonds um, go down in price, in value. The, um, and the bank had exposed itself to a lot of bonds in the US. Those became less valuable. People got worried that because of those losses, the bank would be in trouble and depositors started putting their money uh, out. Normal banks with normal regulation wouldn't have done that. The, um, so I know everyone likes the words Silicon and Valley, uh, but it turns out that people running Silicon Valley Bank shouldn't have been anywhere near running any bank. And US regulators should have been regulating them more because the US, UK bank is tiny, right? The US bank is not tiny, it was a significant bank, and it was being regulated as if it was a small regional bank. So I think there are questions for US regulators. Right, that's the like specifics. Let's step up to the big picture though of how we should think about this more generally. And the big picture is, we all think about rising interest rates in terms of what it's doing to our mortgages, if we're unlucky enough to have one, or then what it does to house prices. When interest rates go up, mortgage payments go up, People who are newly buying houses offer less for those houses because they can't afford as much and house prices come down. So put it simply, interest rates up, house prices down. But the same is broadly true of assets generally. When interest rates go up, as they have done significantly in the last 18 months, asset prices in general will fall and that has repercussions right across the financial sector. Um, And we've seen that now twice causing big problems in the financial sector. First, that was that, in a simple terms, that is what lay behind what happened with pension funds in the UK in the autumn. So first warning sign of of disturbances in the force or the financial sector. And then the second time is what's happened to banks today. So it's banks with big exposures to interest rate risks, taking hits on their balance sheets, and that's scaring people. So that is, and that will occur again. We will see that bubbling up in other bits of the financial kind of plumbing over the coming years, assuming we don't see big falls in interest rates. That will be scaring central banks a bit, but remember they're not, they're putting up interest rates to try to keep inflation down. They're not, you know, they care about financial stability because it's one of their secondary objectives, but they're not changing interest rates to determine uh, that. So their job has just got harder and we should all be thinking about it a bit, sad as it is. They are thinking about where those problems could have emerged. We did kind of know this pension problem in the autumn could have happened and we didn't do anything until it turned up. So there are lessons. Should we panic about loads of British banks going bust tomorrow? No, everyone should stay calm. 
uh, and be glad you're not in Switzerland right now. I'm glad you're saying that because I was um, looking at some commentary on this and uh, he's called Dr. Doom, the guy who like predicted... I'm not sure you should follow someone called Dr. Doom. <laughs> well, yeah. I think it might get you down. I'm <laughs> yeah. just guessing the, well, guy, the guy's vibe ain't going to be like, <laughs> everything's all right, guys. You'd be surprised to hear that was his vibe. Um, <laughs> okay. He said, he described this as um, a, a layman, layman moment. He said, Credit Suisse is too big to fail, but also too big to save. And was kind of forecasting a sort of big crash back to economic baseline. You're saying, no need to worry, let's not be so doom, doom um, well, That's not his actual name, by the way. I've okay, just, I've, well, the economy, he's, so a, he's an economist, that was his nickname, and his name is evading me, okay, so right. I've called him Dr. Definitely. Doom, which no, is pretty I think, happy. No, no, I'm not saying don't worry. So Credit Suisse is a very large bank, yeah. and Switzerland is a rich country, but it's a small country, mm. right? So you don't want very big banks going bust in small countries. Like that bank's balance sheet is several times Switzerland's GDP, right? So this is not all good, and, and Credit Suisse has some very specific circumstances, i.e. people don't think it's very profitable, okay, and they're not sure that it can become profitable. So that's the underpinning problems there. So I don't, I'm not saying we should be relaxed. There's a reason why bank share prices are falling around the world. So this is not like everything's okay, happy days, but the, credits, the Credit Suisse problem, we don't see that in a UK bank um, right now. So I don't think you should be immediately thinking that exact thing is mm. happening. The wider question, which is people reassessing the level of risk in banks, is something for people to be spending their time talking about. I think the Governor of the Bank of England is going to be in front of the Treasury Select Committee next week. He's going to get asked about that. So let's do the budget then. Banks to the budget. <laughs> Banks to the budget. Let's go. Um, top line, really broad. First thoughts, feelings, what's the vibe? How should we, we, be, how should we be feeling on the back of Jeremy Hunt's uh, announcements yesterday? Uh, things are better than we uh, thought, but they're still bad, is basically the headline on the economic forecast and actually on the public finances forecast. Because budgets basically have a number of components always, right? There's different measures, but you get your economic forecast, how's the economy going, what's happening in the labour market, you get your fiscal forecast, how much is the Chancellor borrowing or not borrowing? The, um, and then you get your policy measures, which is what he actually announced that he's going to do. And on this case, on the forecast, as I say, things aren't as bad as we feared, but they're still pretty grim. Uh, if you look at the ec economic outlook, well, people were saying we'd get a deep recession this year. The official forecasts are now saying we like just dodge a technical recession, but the economy shrinks over the course of the year as a whole. But that's not bad, given, you know, if you go back to the 70s, the last big energy shock we had a kind of four percent fall in the size of the economy you know a medium size to deep uh, recession that's what people were thinking we were heading for that isn't what it now looks like the most important reason that's not happening is because energy prices have come down a lot so they basically halved since the november forecast they've come down by about 80 percent since the august high so those falling energy prices mean that the squeeze on household incomes and on the public se the government are just smaller than we feared that's why we're borrowing less but it's also why the recession's not as deep. Jeremy Hunt obviously uh, quite keen to talk about that avoidance of a technical recession. The sort of the key figure in the, those OVR forecasts for me was the 6% drop in living standards, which is the largest since records began. Uh, he was less keen to talk about that. Yeah, and that's understandable. I mean, we're probably all <laughs> less keen to talk about that due to living through it, and it's not a very fun thing to be living through. So just to recap, this is the Office of Budget Responsibility, the official forecaster is saying that household incomes are falling this year. 23, 22, 23, ending in April, and next year, 23, 24. And the two years together are a 6% fall in our incomes. That's a lot of um, money. They say the highest on record, that takes us back to the 50s. Actually, on our numbers, it's the highest in 100 years. So, you know, it's even worse than you uh, <laughs> thought. So you can get your Dr. Gloom guy, Dr. <laughs> Gloom, back out Great. again. Yeah, so is it, look, it's a really bad, um, it's a really bad situation. The, um, it's just not quite as bad as we were fearing. So, you know, take your, take your perk where you can get it. And I guess one of the other perks as well is the extension of the, um, the cap on energy, pri uh, energy bills, the average for a household, £2,500. That's extending to the end of June. Yeah, so this is what you would technically call a no-shit Sherlock policy. Okay, so <laughs> it was completely unhinged that we were having the policy pushing up energy prices that customers face temporarily between April and July. That was what was going to happen if the Chancellor hadn't changed his mind on um, delaying the increase in the energy price guarantee to July from April. So he's done the right thing. He's delayed it. It will save households a few, like, you know, 100 quid a bit more uh, during that period. Overall on energy bills, I think the situation's a bit complex, which is there's good news on wholesale prices, right? They've come down a lot. Europe has learned that it can live without um, as much Russian gas as it is used to, um, and that uncertainty is reduced and therefore prices, the 
price in uncertainty has gone away a bit, and so we've got cheaper prices. Still much higher than we're used to, but cheaper. They've come down on the wholesale price. Because the government had been stopping all the huge surge in wholesale prices feeding through into retail prices for all of us, the, um, you don't immediately get benefits to consumers of that wholesale price falling. The benefit goes to the Treasury, who's then paying less in the subsidies. The thing that was going on was that the wholesale prices were taking a bit longer to feed through to consumers. They weren't going to turn up the cheaper prices until July, whereas the government was like, we'd like to stop coughing up now. And the two together were combining to be like, your bills are going to go up. But stepping back then, what does it mean for punters? It means you're still going to see your energy bill being higher next year than this year. And that is because the government is still providing significantly less support. So even though the wholesale prices are down, the government is also cutting back its support, particularly for higher income households. So on average, you're still going to see a maybe 17% higher energy bill on average next year than this year on the basis of current market pricing. The um, other sort of big, I, maybe the biggest announcement was obviously the announcement on childcare as well. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? So this is a really big deal. The, um, it's a really big deal in a good way if you're about to have a kid, and it's a really big deal in a kind of make you want to slit your throat way if your kid just turned three. Because what the Chancellor is saying is, I'm going to give everybody um, with a child that's aged over nine months of preschool free 30 hours, not every single week of the year, but free 30 hours a week for most um, weeks of the year. And that um, is a very big deal. That's a really big deal, costs about £4 billion. Pounds. It'll take a few years to roll out. But for those families, because remember, childcare costs, that is when they're at their highest. They're like, really, I say as someone whose kids are unfortunately past the ages of one and two, and who has paid through the nose, they, um, they're really high. Uh, he said, we're going to cover that if both parents, or single parent, one parent, if they're working. So it's only an offer for working parents. They, um, and obviously the goal is, look, we're paying for the childcare, so you can go and mm. work. Now, that will have... So first thing, it's a big deal. That's probably the biggest announcement on increased childcare support ever by a chancellor. Um, secondly, it will have the effect he's talking about, which is to encourage more people to work. Exactly how big that effect will be. Who knows the Office of the Budget Responsibility say 60,000. Sounds like a smallish, that's like you know, 0.2% of the workforce, but you know, it's not nothing. The, um, uh, but it but it won't just have that effect. So it gets some people to go to go into work who wouldn't otherwise. It will encourage some people who are in work to work more. So that's still an increase in the labour supply. It's just more hours rather than more people. The, um, so for example, it, it makes quite a lot more financial sense now for somebody who's on a low earnings so or the national living wage now to increase their hours from say 25 hours to 35 hours a week. It didn't make any financial sense for them to do that before this announcement. Now it probably does. So more people will do that. And then the third effect. Um, is that those people who are already using childcare are getting their living standards boosted at a time when they were getting crucified by high childcare costs. So all three of those are good things to do. They, um, uh, I think generally it will be well received. The sector will say we need more money to pay for these places. Totally reasonable. That's what you know, private companies delivering childcare should say. To be fair to the Chancellor, he did also put some extra money in to increase the unit cost they get per hour of having a kid um, when the state is paying for that childcare. So, you know, all in all, pretty big deal, pretty good idea. I think there's some, I don't, I'm not in this position, but I understand that when your child is older, there's kind of a workaround where they sort of charge the kids that are beyond the age a little bit more to kind of subsidise the cost of having the younger Yeah, so like historically the challenge with this free hours offer is you're told you're getting some free hours and then the private provider is basically charging everybody, either you for the hours that you don't get free or everybody else who isn't getting the free hours, seeing their bills inflated to cross-subsidise the fact that the state isn't providing enough cash to cover the free hours is the argument. Mm. That's definitely been going on. The, um, uh, and the scope for that has now gone down a lot because once the state is paying for so much of the childcare, so most providers are now going to be having the state coughing up for almost all of the kids for a significant amount of their time, the ability to cross-subsidise just went down a lot because it was the charging the one and the two-year-old kids' parents to cross-subsidise the three and four-year-olds that got us through the last 10 years. Well, now the state's paying for all of it, so there's nobody less to cross-subsidise because we're not sending the one-week-olds into childcare. So, yes, that's why they're having to increase the generosity of the payment to the providers. From um, cradle to the grave, let's talk about the pension, the pension changes as well. And I appreciate that our audience is a little bit younger, so it's probably not a part of their life they're thinking about. 
But could you explain the changes that have been made in the budget to, I think it's a cap on pensions, isn't it, that's been, that's been lifted? Right, so the, um, this one's a bit techier and like you say, is less relevant to people, particularly if they're young, it's probably never relevant due to the never going to have a pension problem. But let's just step back because there are some old people out there and some of these old people have very large, older, <laughs> and they have very large pensions, yeah. okay? And they have defined benefit pensions, particularly if they're in the public sector, but not just in the public sector. It's probably about 50-50 split between public and private sector if you look at the people with the very biggest pension pots, right? The, um, now, you'll have heard maybe in the news about these doctors saying, I don't want to work because if I do work, the increase in the value of my pension means that I will break what's called the lifetime cap, lifetime allowance on how much you can save tax relieved into pension, into a pension, and then I get a big tax bill. I don't want the big tax bill, right? The, um, so what the Chancellor is saying is, OK, I'm going to abolish that cap. So you used to be able to save uh, just over a million pounds into your pension and have it all tax relieved. He said, I'm going to get rid of that so you can have as much pension as you want, with some caveats that I'll come back to, um, so these doctors will stop quitting and they'll carry on working in the NHS. Now, um, he, he's, trying to do, he's fix, trying to fix the doctor's problem. Good idea. OK, so just to be clear, he's trying to do an OK thing. Good idea. I'm really not sure this is a good way to try and fix it. So here's a, there's, a, there's a number of reasons. So the first is, not all these people are doctors. Right? And as I said, half of them are in the private sector. OK, so it's not clear to me that it's, re it's well targeted at the doctor's problem. Secondly, the, um, it's really expensive. So this costs £1.2 billion. Pounds. The OBR think it's going to get about 15,000 people into work, more people staying in work. Um, so it's costing us 80 grand per person that stays in work. It's a lot of money and it's forever that cost. The, um, uh, thirdly, these are loaded people, right? And if I'm stepping back and looking at the pension system, my, the problem with the pension system is low, loads of low mid learners, or the youth as they are known, are not saving enough into their pensions, uh, far less generous pensions than older workers on defined benefit schemes are able to benefit from. Fixing that problem is the key thing we've got to deal with. They need, we need to help them save more. They, um, and instead, we're spending a billion pounds on people that have already got very large pensions so that they can make sure that they get full tax relief on the pension pot insofar as it's worth over a million pounds. It's not clear to me that's the right priority right now, even if it's motivated by the right objectives. Lastly, I'm not even sure it is going to actually have as big an effect on employment because some people, when you, just make, when you make people who are near retirement just much richer, and that is what's happening here. Yeah? So people that were expecting to pay a big tax charge when they retired have now been told you're not going to pay that. And it's a lot of money, 40 grand maybe in some cases. If you've got a two million pound pension pot, you just got told you aren't paying a 250 grand tax bill. That's, what just, that's what's just happened yesterday. Those people might actually retire earlier because they just got told you're even wealthier than you thought you were, mm. so you don't need to keep saving. So, you can, so for some people, I'm not saying this is going to be big, it's very uncertain, we can't model it, but some people will actually retire earlier because you just gave them shed loads of cash. If you give people shed loads of cash, some people work um, less. So yeah, and so the childcare policy from the Chancellor, good. The um, massive pension tax bung to really loaded people, really, really bad idea. Sort of, yeah, tax break for the top 1%. Is there any, um, is there any possible ramification there for in inheritance tax or tax avoidance? Is there a, a loophole that could be exploited in that way? Or Yeah, so we, the, there's uh, pension tax po relief and policy is really complicated and only sad people understand it all, including people that work on it. Do you it understand it? I do not understand it all. <laughs> there, I understand too much of it, which definitely, enough of it to get me in the sad just, category. Just a bit sad. But, like, but it, there's like a whole world of pain out there that you need to like, I'm definitely not an actuary, thank God. So, um, so the pension tax system is aiming to provide um, two things. It basically allows you to uh, save some money into a pension now without paying tax on it, and then you pay the tax later when you retire and draw down your pension. So it's trying to be neutral to some degree to allow you to spread your consumption over your life from when you're working to when you're not working. But actually, because we actively want to encourage people to save for pensions, because humans are like myopic mice that don't look to the future and don't save enough, so we incentivise it, it by giving them, a, making it actually tax advantage. We do that via the tax-free lump sum. The youth will later, when they are not youth, find out that when they come to retire, you can take 25% of your pension pot tax-free, completely tax-free up front. That is a massive, massive tax cut. The, um, and it's particularly valuable for really rich people because they're 25% of a large figure. Secondly, uh, for complicated reasons about not paying national insurance on the tax, the pension contribution in the first place, it's tax relief for that relief. And then thirdly, 
we don't charge inheritance tax if, um, if I, I die and pass my pension pot onto my kids. So it's t three different ways it's very tax advantaged. Now, the Chancellor has then said there's no cap on how much you can have in this. There's no lifetime cap. There are annual caps on how much you can save, 60 grand a year, but there's no lifetime cap on how much can be saved into a pension pot by an individual. So the danger is people are suddenly like, right, well, I'm going to pile into my pension. Either happy days, I'll live a long time and I'll draw this stuff down and I'll, get, uh, and I'll, be tax I'll have a relatively lower rate of tax on it. That's great. There's some of it can come in a lump sum, some of it won't. The, um, or I won't need the money at which point I've just been given a massively good way of avoiding inheritance tax to give it all to my kids. That is not what a good tax system looks like. It won't make much difference to the vast majority of people that don't pay any inheritance tax anyway, but people with a lot of cash to spare just got given a really easy way. For them, that for, for really rich people, they may be actually better off leaving money in their pension to pass it on inheritance tax free than and just spending out of other money they've got to get them through the day. I mean, that's not what a pension system is for. To zoom out a little bit, to look broader. You're you saying that wasn't. You're saying that was zoomed in. No, no, I'm saying. You're saying we're in the weeds. <laughs> and we yeah. need to get out of the weeds. No, we're absolutely not in the weeds. We've got to get out of the weeds. I, I want to take a broader picture of not just the budget, but sort of the last 13 years of conservative policy. Do you see a generational bias in the way that they legislate and the policies they announce? Because the stuff you're talking about there, I mean, I'm thinking I would love 25% relief on the tax. Like, where, where, where are these things for me? And. Is that just like, like you mentioned, my, my, my own myopia, or is, do you detect a generational gap in, in the way that policy is being created? Um, so I think there's, there's a number of things going on. So I think there's some changes in the economy that have made things like structurally worse relatively for young people compared to older people. Some of those are discussed all the time. The increase in house prices means higher wealth for those that already have got assets older generations in this case, and harder to get on the housing ladder, therefore lower home ownership rates for younger people. But you also see it in the labour market, where younger workers are increasingly concentrated in lower earning sectors, retail, hospitality, leisure. They've always been more in those sectors, but they've become more concentrated over time. They, um, and so their relative earnings are um, lower. They're also disproportionately hit by the financial crisis. So there's a number of longer term trends making life economically relatively harder for young people than older um, workers' pensions is another one on the list. We've managed to kill the defined benefit pension just in time for the millennials to get none of it, they, um, unless they're in the public sector. So then the question is, what is policy doing, given that most of that wasn't policy, it was big, wider economic trends? Most, not all, but most. So then what's policy doing? And I think the danger is that, yes, over the last 13 years, policy has reinforced those problems rather than solving them. I think that is a fair critique of what has been going on. The, um, so that's the being a bit harsh on the government side of it. You can see that in, ben in benefit policy where we've seen big cuts to working age benefits. The um, uh, young families with kids, young people getting lower rates of support with rent um, than they used to get. So they've been cut while we've seen the state pension increase the triple lock over that period. So they've made an active choice to, do the, to push in, along the direction that we were already traveling. Remember, we've now got, for the first time in history, Pensioners, pensioners on average being about the same, if occasionally actually richer than typical working age households. So those not working have incomes on average as high as the working age population. We've never had that in British history um, before. But then stepping back even further to like what's the underlying things driving this, I think it's worth thinking through. We're becoming an older society, so older voters are a bigger part of the, um, the big part of the picture. In general, once you've left the labour market, whether the economy is growing matters a lot less to you. you, don't, you, know, you what matters to you is your house prices, your asset values. Whereas for workers, what matters is the economy growing and is it turning up as wage rises for me? Mm. So I think the bigger problem, leaving aside the politics of it, is are we doing what we need to do to make this economy grow? And does the politics and how voting works in our country make that more difficult? And I'd suggest it does. It's quite hard to get houses built in this country. It's quite hard to get things that we need to do for growth done. The government's just cut public investment again. Uh, HS2's been delayed. The A27 around Arundel, which I'm told is a really big road, someone should build the A27, uh, has been delayed. Like Big cuts coming through to public investment, which had been set at quite high levels by Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, now being cut back. That is a bad idea. That will hold back growth. Um, but that's where, the, um, you know, that's where the priorities are. And that is about political structures and where the incentives are for politicians. It's not just about the politicians themselves. Let's talk a little bit about what wasn't in the budget. 
Um, we've gone. We've had a bit of detail about what was there. The two big omissions for me. I mean, you just touched on one: housing. Very little, if anything, spoken about there, and also public sector pay. What What was obvi glaringly obvious to you by its omission from the Chancellor's budget yesterday? Um, well, let's take those two bits in turn. So, housing. We actually were. You know, I thought they might have actually extended the help to buy. Um, scheme the government's previously had. Now there's pros and cons of that, so I don't love all aspects of it, but I was expecting them maybe to renew that. It's recently expired. That's a support to young first-time um, buyers. That hasn't happened. The second thing that definitely should have happened is that the, what's called the local housing allowance, which is how much, we're in the weeds here, but don't <laughs> give up. <laughs> it's just how much poorer households get from, from uh, benefits to help them cover their rent, okay? That's what I mean. And that amount has been frozen in, since 2019. But since then, rents have gone up quite a lot. And that is increasingly becoming a big problem, particularly in some parts of the, the country. So that needs to be dealt with at some point. You can't permanently have keeping the benefit that pays rent fixed and then have rents going up and up and up. At some point, people can't afford their house. Some people already be in that situation. That is one of the, that policy it, over the last 10 years, bits of that have caused quite significant rises in homelessness as well. So we didn't see those two things on uh, housing sorting out the frozen LHA would have been a really big deal and needs doing. Then on bigger, even bigger gaps from the Treasury, we basically didn't talk about public services full stop. You mentioned one aspect of that, which is public sector pay, where the Chancellor and the budget doesn't engage with the additional pressures that will probably require some additional resources, a few billion pounds to public services to pay for what is about to be done, which is the settlements to make these public sector strikes go away. Those are going to be happening now. Um, that will probably cost, as I say, two, three billion pounds to get a settlement in the region of 5%, I'd have thought, on average, rather than 3.5% the government's been offering. That's where we're heading. Chancellor didn't talk about it, but that's what's now going to happen. Otherwise, you're going to be striking forever. And then looking further ahead, he didn't engage with the fact that we have, although we had quite a large increase in public service spending last year, you'll have noticed that public services aren't going that well if you've tried to see a GP, have an operation, do anything more or less. Um, the, um, so after that big rise last year, which isn't enough to stop the public services being a problem, we basically got five years of pretty low growth in public spending overall penciled in, particularly after the next election. And we obviously have committed to this new childcare spending. The government says it wants to increase dispense spending to 2.5% of GDP at some point. The, um, we always protect the NHS, obviously. The, um, all of that collapses into, if they tried to stick to those spending plans, we're cutting uh, the unprotected departments, the like of the Home Office or the Ministry of Justice, prisons, that means, for ordinary people, um, by about 14%. So it's pretty steep cuts um, that would have to happen to make that possible. It's basically not going to happen, but we didn't engage with that at all. Is there a political vision? Can you, can you detect a kind of bro broad, what is the Chancellor trying to achieve? He's a big statement. What's the political aim? What's he getting at with, with um, yesterday? So what the Chancellor is doing is saying, look, I'm trying to deal with some of the problems that hold back growth in our economy. And he set out quite a big package on trying to get more people into work on employment. And then he set out a pretty rubbish package on encouraging businesses to invest. But bro bro broadly, he wanted more workers and more investment. And he did an OK job on workers and a not very good job on investment. But then again, stepping back, where does that fit in with what the government's trying to argue overall? Well, Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are basically saying, the adults have turned up. We're going to be serious people running a government that's going to just solve some of the problems. Those problems include the Northern Ireland Protocol, the small boats, getting inflation down, getting people back to work. That's what you get with the problem solvers. That's really what the political offer is uh, at the moment. I mean, it's definitely better than the autumn uh, chaos, whatever you think about the, uh, you know, your re overall level of satisfaction with this is definitely an improvement. I'd like some problems sorted out and I'd like less chaos and that's what's happening. You mentioned Autumn there, guiding economic principles and you probably describe Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng as libertarian, economically to the right. What, what are the guiding economic principles behind Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak's government? Fiscal conservatism, how would you describe it? Uh, yeah, I think mean, they're both fiscal conservatives. But actually, I think I would use this use this as a case study for how circumstances, you know, whatever you think you came into politics for, mm. and I'm like, your mum should be interested in what you cared about when you were 18, but I'm less interested. So people are have the, do have their like intuitions and what they're about, but really, what you end up doing is often shaped by the constraints and what the question is that you're being asked at the time. So. Here's another way of saying it. So they are generally, they're economic liberals, both of them, and they're both fiscally conservative in general. 
and all else equal, they'd both rather lower taxes than higher taxes because they're in the Conservative Party for a reason. Uh, but they are overseeing really quite large rises in the tax burden, the tax to GDP, that we're heading for the highest level of tax to GDP in 70 years, really quite big rise, something like 4.5% of GDP of the tax rate, tax burden since 2019. By the end of this period, that's about £4,000 higher per household in the country, right? That's what they're overseeing, but that wasn't what they were about. So the interesting question isn't Jacob Rees-Mogg shouting at them saying, you're a bunch of sickos, why are you so, why are you so soft and why have you gone lefty? Because they're not doing this for fun. The, question, the interesting question is, why are they doing that? Why are taxes going up? And the answer is because the world changed and interest rates turn out to be higher than we thought. And the country is having to spend about 2% of GDP more on debt interest payments. We've got higher debt because we had a banking crisis, then we had a pandemic, and then we had an energy shock. We've got a higher debt level, and then interest rates are higher than we thought they were a few years ago. The, um, and that means the state's got bigger because it's got to pay those bills. And it either does that by putting up taxes, which is what we're doing, or by cutting public services to pay for it. And then secondly, a bit techier, Rishi Sunak announced that increase I mentioned in public service spending, which was quite large after the years of austerity, um, but he announced it before the pandemic hit. And he announced it in cash. You government departments will get this much money in cash for public services. Um, but then the economy is smaller than we thought, right? The, um, so the amount of spending relative to the size of the economy goes up, plus we're paying for the debt interest. That is why the state has got bigger. Right? That's why the state is bigger. The economy's poorer and we're paying higher debt interest uh, bills. And that is why taxes are going up. That's why all of the tax system is basically frozen. Huge fiscal drag. More people being dragged into higher rates of tax. That is what is going on this year, next year, the year after. Um, that brings in a lot of tax revenue to deal with the fact that the state is bigger. And it's not because Rishi Sunak or um, uh, Jeremy Hunt are left wing or right wing. It's because bad stuff happened and you respond to it. What would you do? if you were in his position, as someone who I suspect might harbour political ambitions one day, what would you do if you were in Jeremy Hunt's shoes? Same problems, same solutions, different? One thing you'll, I think you probably, my reflection on British politics is that the gap in the market is not for like slightly overly technocratic uh, <laughs> white middle class men uh, in general. So I'm not sure that is a good idea for anyone. Sure, but let's sure. try and answer your question rather than ignoring the premise of it. So what could you have done differently? So he's right to want to raise business investment. But he, instead of announcing a long-term permanent corporate tax regime, he's announced the fifth change in corporation tax in the last two years. And if there's one thing that businesses hate more than the actual high level of corporation tax, it's chopping and changing on it. So we just need to stop doing that. We should, the system he's actually come up with temporarily for the next three years, it's perfectly decent. You know, I've got my own like, preferred version of it, but let's forget that. He should have just done that permanently rather than fiddling with it. Uh, on boosting employment, uh, what he's done on childcare, is good. We talked about the free hours, but he's also actually done something pretty good on universal credit, which is if you're getting your childcare support through universal credit and you go into work, you will now get the support to pay your first childcare bill up front rather than having to claim it back after you paid, which was a real barrier to some lower earners going into work. So that's good too. So childcare broadly good. Again, could moan at the edges, but broadly good. On older workers, I, I wouldn't have done at all what he has uh, done, big bung for a keeping a few doctors in work. I mean, there are other ways to keep the doctors uh, in work, which would have been worth exploring and wouldn't have cost us 80K um, a pop. But I think it is worth generally thinking about how to keep more older workers in the workplace. There's other reforms, bigger reforms to the pension tax relief system that would have done that without being big giveaways for the top. And we do need to be helping lower earners and lower income households save more for their pensions. There's lots of ways to do that. The, um, in fact, we've made quite a lot of progress actually in the last 10 years with what's called auto-enrolment, encouraging people to save into their pensions, the, even if not um, enough. Uh, in terms of what he's done on disability benefit reform, which you haven't really touched on, but it's probably the biggest reform of disability benefits, which remember, people used to talk about that as if it was a fringe part of the benefit system. It is not fringe. We're talking millions of people now relying on this benefit. We've got big growth in mental ill health coming up and turning up in the benefit system in the same way that it's turning up in all our lives with our friends. The, um, uh, on that, he set out a long-term reform, I won't go into all the weeds, but to scrap one of the tests that they use to decide who gets support in the benefit system. That is aimed at the right thing, but it is going to be very hard um, to do well. So doing that over a long timeline is sensible because these are people with, you know, often in very vulnerable situations, both in terms of their health, but also in terms of their finances. People with disability tend to be a lot poorer than the country as a whole. So going slowly on that is the right thing to be doing. 
What was your analysis of Keir Starmer's critique? Because uh, he described us as the sick man of Europe, which obviously has political harkbacks, etc. Do you think that's a fair criticism to make of Britain right now? Well, stepping back, yeah, I mean, look, Britain's in relative decline. It's had a tough 15 years. Growth this parliament is uh, the lowest for any parliament since the first term of the Margaret Thatcher's, Thatcher's government back in the 1980s. We're on course on the basis of these forecasts to have the uh, to be the first parliament on record where we are poorer at the end of it than the beginning. So that's quite hard. So in 2024, we'll be poorer than we were in 2019, you know, and we didn't feel that loaded in 2019 in most cases. So I think that is... That's a pretty bad situation to be in. I think the question for the Labour Party is obviously, OK, y yes, you can read the numbers, they're pretty bad. What do you want to do about it? The, um, and in lots of cases, the government's obviously stolen some of their thunder on policy this week in terms of some big childcare offer, uh, extending the support for energy bills for another three months. These are things the Labour Party's broadly been calling for. So what is Labour's big vision? I'd say if you were being looking at what they've said overall, you'd say they are saying it's very much in the green economy space, borrowing a bit to then invest in the green economy, growing new kinds of jobs in the future. I think those are important. We do need to make sure that we are um, a part of those industries of the future. Offshore wind is a big and obvious example. But most people aren't going to work in those industries, and they're relatively small compared to the economy as a whole. So we do need to get serious about wider questions of what makes our economy tick, and also like what gets the private sector investing. That needs to happen. Because... One of his key missions that he announced recently was fastest growth in the G7, right? We should definitely have that. Oh, yeah, great. We need... Obviously. <laughs> that. Someone should get that. Yeah, why has no one done that? You look at the US, Inflation Reduction Act, huge piece of legislation, stimulus. The EU, Green New Deal, same again. Where's ours? Well, I mean, again, you just talk to Keir Starmer or Rachel Reeves. I think they would say they would like to do a version of that. Yeah. My personal view is... You need to be a bit careful because the US and the EU are much bigger mm. economies than us. And in a world where what you're really saying is more people are going to subsidise green industries, the effect of that in the end is less trade on those industries, and probably. And it means that how big your home market is is more important in determining where production happens, right? Because you want the subsidies that come. And so, the, um, so Americans will subsidise production in America to service their market, many times bigger than ours. And people within the EU will subsidise production in the EU and they'll service their home market. And we'll sit there being like, ah, oh, excuse me, small country over here, we're not going to produce stuff. Remember, economies of scale exist, so you need to be producing in large volumes. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do what the Labour Party is talking about. And actually what Jeremy Hunt said he was thinking about, he said it in the budget yesterday, he's thinking about what his response to the Inflation Reduction Act is, although he said he would wait until the autumn to tell us what it was, which may be a little late. But broadly, he said he's thinking about it. The, um, so you need to think a bit harder. You need to think about what are the industries within that space, maybe don't go as broad as the US and the EU are going, where we have a comparative advantage, we're good. I mentioned wind power, that's something worth focusing on. Carbon capture and storage is often mentioned as well. Um, then you need to think about industries that we need anyway for energy security. So like, that's just like broadly, we need to be able to produce our own e energy um, cheaply and securely. So you're going to want to think about those things. The government's already doing quite a lot in that space. Jeremy Hunt talked about nuclear power quite a lot yesterday as well. So you do that. And then on other industries, we'll do particularly well at ones that have smaller economies of scale where you can produce them cheaply in a smaller market. Those are also worth thinking about. So you need to step back and say not... So a load of people say to me, well, Joe Biden just shouldn't be doing these subsidies. That's what the economic liberals say. And then the lefties say, we should just do exactly the same. We need to do our own Inflation Reduction Act. Neither of these is good strategic thinking. We need to say, what is the nature of the UK economy? What is the world economy doing on these industries? And then where do we fit in? And, we, and where can government plausibly make a success of that? And those are the steps I would follow to think that through. And also just remember, this is about consumption, not just production. So if the US wants to subsidise a load of cheap solar power, right, um, uh, that diversifies our supply chain, because at the moment we're too reliant on China for the production of solar panels. They, if they want to pay for that to be produced in the States and we get it cheaply, well, happy days, I'll have some of that, because we're not going to be producing solar panels en masse in the UK. Torsten Bell, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure to speak to someone who understands these things, because I don't. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks a lot.